What's up, RPG people? This is BardicCollege.com, and today we are with John Stater, the Hex Whisperer. But he is also a ninefold published author of many different kinds of RPGs. He's made nine, more than nine different flavors of OSR, as well as his own magazine and a blog. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, let's just kind of go through all of your work and talk about what it's all about. We'll start with the OSRs that you've made. I see the, it seems like the biggest project that you've made is Blood and Treasure. Is that right? Yeah, probably. That was, um, uh, what eventually happened with Blood and Treasure was I was writing everything for Swords and Wizardry. Um, The problem was I like to use a lot of stuff from kind of the whole span of D&D. And Swords and Wizardry is very focused on, you know, a particular version of D&D. And so what I had to keep doing was statting up monsters and statting up different spells and including them in. So, I mean, some of the old, you know, issues of Nod would have like six or seven pages of monster stats just because it wasn't in the Swords and Wizardry rule book. So I had to give people that information. And a lot of it would come out of those uh, Necromancer games, uh, Tome of Horrors. So you're filling out the, the, the open gaming license thing at the end. You got to put each one in individually. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And so I thought, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to make like a monster book and like a spell book, convert all this stuff once, have this stuff out there, maybe just as like a free download or something. But also then when I reference it, I can just reference that book. And I don't have to, you know, do all the individual where everything came from. And so I started working on that project and realized if you're going to do that with all the monsters and all the spells, you're about 75% um, done with, with, with the whole project. And you might as well finish it up. So uh, I found on the Internet, somebody had summarized uh, the Blood and Treasure second edition. And this is what they said. It's a hybrid Mix of many editions includes elements from AD&D, OD&D, BX, 3rd Edition, Pathfinder, and from other OSR games. That's probably mostly true. I mean, I've never played Pathfinder, so if, if there's elements of that in there, I, I, it wasn't intentional. <laughs> um, but, but there could yeah. certainly be. Because, um, I mean, we're all, we're all working with the same basic rule set. You're using 20-sided dice. There's only so many ways to do resolution there. Um, when I did second edition, it was sort of a, what were they writing about in old, you know, D&D or in old Dragon magazines? What are the simple ways to handle things rather than, you know, because I mean, obviously, if you go to like third edition, you know, everything has 50 steps in it and a million modifiers. And I, I don't want to do that. I, I guess what I could say is I wanted to keep the rules simple, but have it be very broad. Dude, if you want to have robots involved with dinosaurs and involved with a paladin go for it it's all in the game all the pieces are there assemble them the way you want to assemble them. so i tried to come up with like what's a cool thing i can do with each of the classes uh the, the druids had sacrifices they could do to get more power the wizards had sort of like or magic users have like little bits of knowledge they you know might possess about how to make certain things it actually came from watching a old episode of uh sir lancelot it was like a i think a 50s british tv show and they had a merlin who knew how to make flash powder and stuff and i thought yeah they do that a lot and stuff but they don't really have that in dnd okay well let's do something like that with these guys right on um and your other osr flavors i i call them flavors uh are they more focused on a specific thing it's it it is more focused my initial idea with those this is something I thought of a while ago was, wouldn't it be cool to do different editions of a game or different versions of a game, each one illustrated by a different artist? At the time, I didn't remotely have enough money to go grab an artist and commission that much art to do something. But so I thought, well, what if you instead you just did different variations on, on gaming? So there's one that's like the weird fantasy edition that's very... It's like Clark, you know, uh, Clark Ashton Smith and, and Dunsany and, and a little Lovecraft, not too much of that. 
there's one that's so the sinew and steel one is like really no magic. It's more like let's just ground this in, in reality, so to speak. So you took magic you know, out of so, that one. Yeah, I kind of took magic out of that one. And that um, was sinew and steel, right? Yeah, sinew and steel. Um, there's a fairy tale edition or mother goose edition. Mother goose, yep. Yeah, they kind of focused on that sort of those sort of characters. Um, they all work with each other. So you could kind of, if you bought them all, you could throw in elements of each one. Uh, it's all using the same basic rule set. It's just sort of little variations, different, maybe different races or some different set of monsters or the spells or what have you. If, if you took like blood and treasure and split it into the classic one has all your basic stuff. The other one has some of the stuff that came from more modern editions. Same rule set though. It's, it's still old school rules. It looks like, uh, in, is it OSR rules, but it's covering superheroes? Mystery Men? Yeah, Mystery Men. That was one of the earlier ones I did. Um, kind of the same idea. I, I did an article in Nod because I came up with what I thought was a way to to use, like, essentially to use your whatever D&D rules you like best and use them to run a superheroes game. When you're doing superheroes, you've got you to veer a little further away from... Um, kind of your classic old school games. Um, you know, when you have normal human beings next to people who can run at the speed of light or pick up planets, you got, you got interesting scales you have to work with. That was probably the hardest part of that game was trying to come up with a way you got to go kind of abstract and kind of freeform because the, I mean, if, I guess if you focus and said, I'm going to just write a game that's really focused on like Superman level type characters or I'm going to do something that's like Batman level characters. You could really kind of focus in and make it simple. When you're saying I'm going to do something that can have Batman next to Superman and they're going to be able to work together. And it's actually going to make sense. The guy playing Superman is not going to completely dominate the game. That was the trick. What was your experience in, in actually playing it? I've, I've done a couple play. I did a play test on it early. And then I actually ran a campaign online um, on Google Plus, and man, it actually worked super well. And I'm not saying because the rules are awesome, but the campaign itself really worked well. Uh, it was set in the 60s, and it was Nazi scientists who were going to kind of resurrect Hitler as a super creature who could control the world or whatever. And so they all, you know, gradually are filling in the clues, and then they become a team, and they finally have a big fight at the end. And it really worked well. Um, the one thing I did learn, and I've talked about this in other versions, a superhero game is not a superhero comic. The last fight, one of the characters, they were all going into this castle in like the Alps where the evil scientists are going to you know, do their thing. I got this brilliant idea. We split the party. So they split up. Two of them go straight into this tower where the real thing's happening. The third one, the uh, fifth guy doesn't. And while they're having this big fight, the fifth guy is running through kitchens and dining rooms, and he's trying to find the big battle, and he can't. And it was hilarious, and we all had a good time laughing about it. And he did finally get there for the very end. But you're going, yeah, this is just not how comic books work. I mean, maybe the old you know, Justice League ones where they were kind of comical. Did I miss any of your publications? Um... Uh, well, I got Grit and Vigor, which was sort of it's a modern that. version. You know, it's similar to like Blood and Treasure. You could probably use the two rule sets together, but it's it's modern role playing. So say from like, oh, probably more like the 20s up until maybe up until modern times. It doesn't get heavy into the technology, but you got your cars. You can do your car chases. You got your guns. Oh, man, it was really hard. It took a long time to find a way to make it work. That was interesting to me because what I found out was I hate the modern SRV. It was terrible. So gradually, I kind of figured out a way to do the characters the way I like. Um, but then, I mean, I, I put a stupid amount of research into the firearms and into the vehicles to try to come up with a way to make it make sense. Um, so anyway, it, it was it was entirely too much work for what I ended up making. But um, but I was pretty proud of it. I think it came out pretty good, actually. Uh, so I did that. I, I got a game called Space Princess that's like a very one-shot beer and pretzels go into the space fortress, rescue the space princess, get out. Kind of the basic Star Wars concept, right? Um, there's really no leveling up in it. It's just, here's your character, go to it. Um, 
uh, like I said, Pars Fortuna I mentioned before, which was kind of a weird little. Uh, I'd like if I likened it to anything, it would be like Talis Lanta. If you remember that, that was sort of the no elves. This is sort of there's no elves, dwarves, etc. It's different kinds of races, different kinds of monsters, different spells than you're used to. But you know, if you're playing it like a swords and wizardry, Pars Fortuna might be a way to like spice it up a little bit because they will work together. Um, I'm working on a second edition of that that'll work more with Blood and Treasure. Um, I don't know when I'm going to get that thing done. Um, I've done a series called Quick and Easy. That was, um, the idea was something you could just kind of put in your back pocket, take on a road trip, just need like a six-sided dice to play most of them. Although I think the last one I did, I went a little further afield than that. Um, and actually the most successful, one of the Quick and Easies is a game called Pen and Paper Football, which isn't a role-playing game at all. It's literally just playing American football on pen and paper. And um, man, I've sold like over 200 of them already. It's unbelievable. It's really cheap for one thing, which probably helps because it's a pretty short game. But um, I probably had more fun making and play testing that thing than I have on anything else I've done. Because once the rules were coming together, you know, I'm, I'm testing it out and I'm like going, okay, well, I need to make this long pass. Oh my God, it was intercepted. And you're going, you just rolled a dice. Why am I getting excited? about this make-believe team intercepting the other team. But it was, it was kind of fun. And uh, and then designing all the football helmets because I just like doing that. So anyways, that one's done pretty well. Um, God, I don't know. I think that's all of them. Who knows? I have written so much now. Well, you heard it from the man himself. Go check out his blog, landofnod.blog. All right, John. Well, thank you very much. Everybody, if you liked this show, please like or subscribe and or both. Until then, uh, signing out, bardiccollege.com.